Hello, friends, and greetings from VLCC, and a very good afternoon to all of you. I'm Dr. Anju Kai, Vice President and Head Preventive Healthcare at VLCC, with over 35 years in medical and wellness practice. And today's webinar is part of a monthly series of webinars that we always do our educational contribution to holistic wellness through quality information and healthy lifestyle choices. My esteemed co-panelists are today, Dr. Rajiv Parak, Chairman, Division of Peripheral Vascular and Endovascular Sciences at Medanta, and uh, Senior Cardiologist, Dr. Dheeraj Bhatia, and Nutrition Expert, Dr. Deepti, each of whom uh, you will meet shortly. And you know what? November is a very, very exciting and very special month for us. Every year, we observe the 26th as Anti-Obesity Day when we renew our commitment to wellness for all with special focus on preventing and eliminating obesity and its consequences. So our focus today is, you know, diabetes and related vascular disease. So what is this, uh, what is this diabetes all about? Okay. So just in short, it's actually a group of diseases. Type one diabetes is when the body doesn't produce enough for any of the hormone insulin, which is usually found in young people. Type 2 diabetes is when the body doesn't properly use the insulin that is produced. And the third type is the gestational diabetes, which occurs only during pregnancy. And, uh, you know, in all these conditions, the cells of our body are unable to take the glucose, their source of energy from, uh, this is from the blood. And this results in fatigue and constantly run down feeling. So there is too much of sugar in the blood, but too little inside the cells. So this high sugar levels in the blood over a long period of time can seriously damage our blood vessels. Something our specialists, uh, Dr. Rajiv Parak and Dr. Dheeraj Bhatia will tell us more about, okay? So, but you know, diabetes can unfortunately go undetected for years showing no outward symptoms. And that's why we call it as diabetes, which is a silent killer. And, uh, you know, sadly, India is the diabetes capital of the world. The disease is spreading really at an alarming rate and touching more and more of the young. So we want to make sure that you will not become one of this group. If not diagnosed early and managed appropriately, the consequences can be very, very serious, even life-threatening. So long-term complications of diabetes, they develop, you know, gradually. The longer you have diabetes, the less control your blood sugar, the higher the risk of complications. The good news is the risks can be avoided. Timely detection, and management of diabetes is thus the most sensible advice. And this is the scope of today's webinar, understanding how to prevent and learning how best to manage diabetes and vascular disease if you have it. The coming Sunday, 13th of November is the World's Diabetes Day and uh, we should not need uh, an annual reminder to stay healthy, right? It should be part of how we live our lives and make it make you know right choices about what we do, what we eat, and how we live. So let's learn from our esteemed panel of highly experienced doctors, and they will address the questions most of you have asked while registering, and also any other questions you may ask us as we go along. So uh, let's let's get going, and I'm really very delighted to welcome and introduce to you our first panelist for today, Dr. Dheeraj Bhatia. Dr. Bhatia, you all know him. He has over 35 years of clinical consultancy practice in New Delhi and has been a senior consultant cardiologist with the Scott's Heart Institute and Max uh, Super Speciality, Delhi. 
and uh, he's been honored twice by BMA and IMA as their Doctor of Excellence awardee. And he has been part of the core medical research team who has laid down guidelines for defining the management of PCOS and obesity in Asians. And of course, he's been the senior medical advisor to BLCC for last 20 years. So good afternoon, Dr. Bhatia, and welcome to the webinar. And thank you so much for joining us today. Very good afternoon, uh, Dr. Anjugai. Thanks for the introduction. Um, and viewers, uh, thank you very much for joining us for this knowledge empowerment program, which we do uh, usually on the 15th of every month. Uh, this time, my dear friend, Dr. Parik, uh, who has uh, joined us, he'll be traveling, uh, he'll be going overseas, so we kind of preponed it this time. Um, but nevertheless, we are really very, very happy to have him here and, uh, you know, to, to learn from his experience. And he has, he is like a walking encyclopedia when it comes to vascular diseases. Uh, so I'm sure we'll all benefit. And he puts things across very simply and eloquently. So we should uh, really have a very interesting late afternoon, early evening. Um, so I think Anju, just to start the ball rolling. Yes, and, thank uh, you. And what's the first question uh, which you yes. would like? So obviously we, we, are, uh, we are going, uh, we are learning about diabetes. So uh, we would li like to start with what are the common symptoms of diabetes, doctor? Okay, so Dr. Anju, before we go on to symptoms of diabetes, uh, you see classical symptoms of diabetes. Uh, I think even in school, they start teaching you that you have increased thirst. Uh, and that's because you're passing more urine. So, you know, uh, so increased frequency of urination, uh, you urinate often and you feel very hungry. That's another symptom, you feel very thirsty. So these are the triad, classical diabetes uh, triad. But much before this happens, there is something called pre-diabetes. And that I want to highlight today should not be missed. So in pre-diabetes, the first symptom which occurs is fatigue, fatigue and fatigue, which is tiredness. Now this is happening because there is something, the cells, they have receptor blocker, uh, blockage, which is called insulin receptor blockage. Now, when they have this kind of blockage, the problem that arises here is that um, the sugar does not go inside to give us enough uh, energy calories. So they land up with fatigue. Added to that, if you are low on vitamin B12, the entire nervous system bathes in B12. So out of all the vitamins, B12 is the most important, especially for a diabetic. If your B12 is low and you have, uh, you know, pre-diabetes, your fatigue is going to be profound. So anybody who's having fatigue and you've ruled out other causes of fatigue, like anemia and thyroid, uh, low proteins, one should think of pre-diabetes and get uh, one's fasting sugar at least. Uh, but a better test would be your three months uh, glycosylated hemoglobin, which is called HbA1c. Very, very important to do this test and that, therefore you can diagnose that you are pre-diabetes. So the symptom of fatigue is not to be forgotten. It's a very, very important uh, symptom. There are some other symptoms which come up because insulin, if it is high, uh, you have sodium retention. So you start getting swelling. And doctors will say, oh, it's hormonal, hormonal. But you have to define. You see, there are thousands of hormones. So what is it? So basically, there's a link between insulin and the sodium retention. And therefore, you get this swelling. Uh, starts with the feet. And later on, with this uh, continuous chronic retention, you land up with hypertension. So this is one of the very important things which I wanted to highlight is fatigue, uh, pre-diabetes, and then like diabetes, I've already told you three main symptoms. Added to that, you have blurring of vision, another very important symptom, and delayed wound healing. Delayed wound healing, you will have people coming to you and think, Dr. Saab, I've got an ulcer here, there, whether it's in the mouth or your legs or anywhere. They'll say, why is it taking so long to heal? So, you know, you keep changing antibiotics, but what you don't do is you're not looking at the sugar levels. If the sugar levels are high, that's a great media for the bacteria to proliferate. Bacteria are very happy. So therefore you, or you keep getting chronic infections again and again, repeated sinusitis, repeated urinary infection. So that's another problem. So these, these are the major symptoms which we, we come across. Type one diabetes mellitus, the symptoms come on uh, suddenly, more acutely, uh, patient is more ill, they're more severe, while type 2 diabetes mellitus, it is slow process. There, there is slow 
symptoms come on, a patient may also be asymptomatic. And in type 1, one loses weight, profound weight loss. In type 2, usually one starts gaining weight. There are various reasons for that. So these are the common symptoms and the slight difference in type 1 and type 2. But type 2 will usually be slow, chronic, uh, mild symptoms, and very often till the disease advances, one doesn't come to know unless one is aware of it, and then it's much too late to reverse anything. So that's the answer, Dr. Andrew. Right, right, right. So very aptly put, uh, pre-diabetes should not be ignored. It is reversible. While once you get diabetes, then it has to be managed and controlled. It's as simple as that. So do not ignore even the slightest of the symptoms if you're getting like fatigue and edema and uh, other things that Dr. Bhatia just mentioned. So doctor, uh, once person has diabetes, what complications can occur? So uh, I'll start with the most uh, dreaded complication, which really happens in type one, that is called diabetic ketoacidosis, that is DKA. So what happens actually, what is diabetic ketoacidosis, which puts you into coma and you may even have convulsions and they can be brain damaged. So usually in type one, but what happens is that there is hardly or no insulin in the body. So the sugar cannot enter the cells to provide energy. Now the body needs energy. So what it does is it uses proteins and it uses fats. Now the breakdown of the proteins will for is ketones. And the ketones, they lead to acidosis. So this acidosis is very bad for the body. The whole blood pH changes. And that can have an effect on the brain as well. And therefore, it's a condition we call diabetic ketoacidosis, most dreaded complication. The other types, which happen in type 2 and type 1 also, but usually in type 2, which is chronic, uh, long-standing uh, high sugar, is, you know, blurring of the eyes. Now, the eyes, they can be glaucoma, they can be cataract, they can be retinal involvement, they can be in the retina, they can be hemorrhages, or they can be uh, thrombosis, uh, which means clots. And further, if you go down to the brain, uh, you can have uh, various clots and you can have, um, you know, you can have a stroke or you can have a TI, which is a, a reversible within the first uh, 24 hours. A stroke is reversible. Uh, you also can have, you know, vertigo uh, because it affects the nerves. You can have peripheral neuropathy or neuritis, uh, which is usually bilateral in the lower limbs, where you have uh, ants calling, feeling, or, uh, you know, uh, you have tingling or you have uh, numbness. So these start, or pain in the legs as it advances. So these are like neuropathy signs. Then you can have um, a heart problem. You know, heart attacks can happen. And uh, again, this, the pathogenesis is the same. It's all because of the clots uh, and the high cholesterol and the triglycerides, which go along with diabetes and uh, uh, the, the other reasons also why this happens. And by and by, the kidneys also can suffer. And you'll find that if it's not you know, properly treated, uh, chronically, uh, patients land up on dialysis, and which is not good because then you're looking around for donors and things. And the most important one, uh, the most dangerous one is uh, is vascular uh, of the lower limbs, where you start having clots in the legs, uh, and there those those can lead to even you know uh, gangrene. Um, there's a wide spectrum of symptoms which Dr. Parikh will very nicely explain to you. Uh, but finally, it's a you know when you hear about diabetes and gangrene, uh, one gets the shudders. So we don't want a person to reach that stage because things can be sorted out much, much before. Um, and therefore, you know, we thought today that since Diabetic Day is coming up and is so rampant, we must have him on board uh, because, you know, he, he specializes probably one of the best in the country and we should, you know, hear from him how this thing has to be approached. Very important. Uh, any other question? I think we should move yes, to Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so right, rightly, uh, Dr. Bhatia has put it that extra sugar in the blood leads to changes in our vascular system and that causes changes in almost all the organs including heart, brain, kidney, the nerve, the feet, 
the oral health, the vision, the skin, even the mental health. So, uh, Dr. Bhatia, this uh, peripheral vascular disease, the changes which are happening in the blood vessels due to diabetes. Now, uh, this vascular disease, it often, you know, goes undiagnosed. And why is that so? Is it confused with something else or and what is the common test you can suggest to clear the diagnosis? No, really, uh, when, you know, when a when person starts having this vascular insufficiency, which less blood flow to the lower limbs, uh, they very often they start presenting, like I was telling you, tingling, pins and needles or pain, especially at night. So when they go to the GP, uh, what I've seen is that they start off giving painkillers. And there is some medicine called gabantin that is being very commonly used. Uh, you know, the line is very thin between the nerves getting affected in diabetes and the vascular, the vasculature, very, very thin line. So one has to do a proper examination of the lower limbs, where you look at the pulses, the reflexes, and then also you're a little confused. Then it's a good idea to go in for a nerve conduction test to rule out that there is, uh, you know, no, no involvement of the nerves. Now, Similarly, Dr. Parikh will talk about tests which are going to be done for the lower limbs because I don't want to take that away from him and he will very nicely put that across. But yes, what I would say is lower limbs, you're not only looking at some people have got a mindset, oh, it's a nervous thing. Somehow it goes just like that all the time. You know, most people, you know, even in our younger days, we used to always say, okay, diabetes, this is a nerve problem. Not realizing that the vascular is pretty common also and more dangerous, I would say. So therefore, that has to be evaluated also clinically and then by test. Ruling out nervous thing is, of course, the gold standard is getting a nerve conduction test of velocities uh, done by a neuroelectrophysiologist who is good at it because you can make a lot of mistakes. You have technicians doing it this day, these days with no doctor's signature, which is absolutely wrong. Uh, things like this happen only in our country. But anyway, uh, this, uh, you know, further going further and looking at the other testing, which uh, Dr. Parikh is authority on, I think let's, um, you know, yeah. let, let's now get, get him on board and okay. uh, let, let's find out what's happening. This should be very Thank interesting. I uh, myself uh, waiting to learn from him. Yes, yes, of course. Thank you so much, Dr. Bhatia, for yeah. your useful insights. And of course, like, like Dr. Bhatia said, we have to uh, bring in uh, Dr. Parikh, Dr. Rajiv Parikh to deepen our understanding and address the related questions. And we are really very honored to welcome him. And let me just introduce him. And Dr. Rajiv Parikh is the Chairman, Division of Peripheral Vascular and Endovascular Sciences at uh, Medanta, the Med City in Gurgaon. He has special interest in endovascular uh, management of peripheral vascular disease, peripheral endovascular and surgical procedures for limb salvage, keratid, uh, you know, endartectomy for stroke prevention and non-surgical management of varicose veins and venous thromboembolism and newer anti-thrombotic drugs. So Dr. Parikh has been past vice president and inter, uh, um, he's been past vice president of International Society for Vascular Surgery in USA. He's the founder and life member of Vascular Society of India, founder and executive committee member of Endovascular Intervention Society of India, member of European Society of Vascular Surgery, and ex-national convener, convener for the fellowship fellowship program in vascular surgery of the National Board of Examiners, New Delhi. And um, he's been awarded with so many, um, you know, awards. He's been honored by the Delhi Medical Association with Professor Hari Vaishnava Oration Award, being the editor of European Journal of Vascular Surgery, organizing chairman 13th annual conference of vascular society of india attended by president and treasurer of the vascular society of great britain and he was awarded the golden dupli oration annual conference of association of surgeons of india award so um, welcome to our webinar dr parak we are so happy and it's such a pleasure having you today with us uh, welcome once again Thank you, Dr. Anju. Thank you, Dheeraj, for very kind words. I really 
um, I'm honored to be on uh, this platform, sharing this platform with, uh, of yours, which uh, obviously uh, very talked about. And a lot of people, when I just mentioned that I was going to be uh, involved in this platform, they said, oh my God, you've reached there. I said, well, <laughs> it is something which is, uh, yes. So so thank you very much for, for having me on board. And uh, yes, I've, I've, I've heard what uh, you've been discussing with uh, Dr. Dheeraj and of course, He's a past master at this, and he is obviously, uh, you know, very scientific in his approach and deals with, uh, with conditions as they are supposed to be dealt with, not as a knee-jerk reaction. I think that is extremely important in the subject that we are discussing today. It's not that just because you have diabetes, you have to be on insulin or on a tablet. There are lots of other things which have to be looked at and sounded because there are it's like, it's like, as I say, it's like a termite infection. It just goes and inroads into the body and, and just practically destroys every organ of the body, starting from your hair down to your toenails. So Absolutely. nothing is left untouched by diabetes. Yes, yes. So very uh, truly said, and that's why we are so happy to have you here. And uh, so let me start and let me share the first question from our audience. And obviously it goes that uh, because we are talking about the vascular disease, so how does diabetes affect the blood vessels and which are the blood vessels which get affected normally? Uh, that's, that's a very good question. See, actually, I think I must tell you that diabetes uh, basically increases the deposition of cholesterol inside the blood vessels. You know, we have these... Uh, I can show you a little model which I have here. This is a normal blood vessel and this gets, you know, a little bit of cholesterol gets deposited on this and this is the beginning of deposition of cholesterol. Then the cholesterol plaque or this becomes even bigger and then the artery becomes narrow. So diabetes actually, the, you know, increases the progression or the rate of deposition of cholesterol inside the blood vessels throughout the body. So if it affects the blood vessels of the heart, one gets what is called a heart attack, which we all know about. If it affects the blood vessels supplying blood to the neck, to the brain, through the neck to the brain, it causes a heart attack of the brain. That's called a brain attack or a stroke, which uh, Dr. Bhatia talked about. So you get a heart attack of the brain. If the blood vessels supplying blood to the legs get affected, that's a heart attack of the legs. It's the same disease. It's the same condition is just affecting a different part of the body and that is what is called the leg attack now the consequences of these attacks various attacks whether it's in the brain heart or in the legs is dependent on the organ which is affected so essentially all the blood vessels in the body get affected and more so in diabetes and the rate of progression or the speed of deposition of cholesterol is directly uh, proportional to the uh, deteriorating uh, diabetic control and if you do not approach Dr. Bhatia and get your diabetes under control, you are going to land up with complications and the longer the diabetes is in your body, which means that if you develop it at age of 30 or 40 and you live up to the age of 60, that means diabetes has lived in your body for 30 years, the chances of complications are much higher. If you develop diabetes, if you are age 80 or 85, then the complications are much lower because diabetes hasn't been able to infest your body just the way the termites would. Right, right, right. So, uh, of course, uh, uh, once we know that uh, we have diabetes and it's happening all over in our body, in our vascular, in our blood vessels and all, so how does uh, one know that uh, the blood vessels are getting blocked and uh, what are the symptoms like? What do we look for? Yeah, so uh, you see the blood vessels, as I told you, get blocked in the legs. We are just concentrating on the peripheral vascular, which means in the legs. And this depends on the rate of deposition of cholesterol. So as the cholesterol starts to get depo uh, de um, deposited, the arteries tend to become narrower and narrower, which means that the blood supply going down into the legs reduces as time goes on. And as this happens, the person is unable to walk. Uh, can I request uh, uh, Mr. Hardik to put on the first slide? I think that's, a, I have a little slide for this, if they can share that. 
Yeah. So this is essentially, if you see the man on the right, he is absolutely fine. He's walking around. He's absolutely uh, good to go. Then he suddenly starts having pain on walking. The pain is not in the in the joints. The pain is in the muscles of the thighs or the legs and in the feet. And this prevents him from walking or maybe not walking enough. And then this pain eventually becomes progressively worse and the pain is there at rest, which means that the patient is unable to get up and even go into the washroom. So this pain, uh, we, we can, uh, yeah, you can uh, uh, stop sh sharing, please. So this, um, uh, essentially, the progression of the artist blockages is what is actually something which, um, uh, yeah, you know, we, we, which can be picked up as, as a, a progressive symptom. This can actually progress on to a complete blockage of the artery and that would lead to what Dr. Dheeraj said, gangrene, which means that a part of the foot or the toe or the ankle somewhere, that part, uh, part of the body would be dead and it turns into what is called gangrene. Once gangrene is established, once gangrene has occurred, obviously that part has to be amputated. So depending on the extent of diabetes, I mean, uh, uh, extent of deposition of cholesterol and the occlusion of the artery, you could land up with an amputation of the foot even above knee. So it is something that we really need to be worried about and picked up as early as possible. So if we, if anybody who has blockages in the arteries and is finding it difficult to walk, that's the time to call a specialist. That's the time to get the blood vessels checked. That's the time to stop this progression. Otherwise, you might land up in complications. Wow. Thank you. So yes, uh, definitely we won't want anybody to go to, to the gangrene level and therefore uh, the right diagnosis is so very important and uh, uh, we would like to know from you doctor that uh, who should uh, one, first of all, we approach for the right diagnosis and what tests can show that the blood vessels are blocked? Well, uh, the person who would actually be most involved with this would be a vascular specialist, somebody who is, uh, uh, you know, committedly and dedicatedly looking after the blood supply of the legs or the heart or the brain or, or, or uh, for that matter, of the limbs as well. So a vascular specialist, a peripheral vascular specialist is the person that would be uh, extremely important to go to. It's because it's not about just opening up an artery. An artery is blocked. It doesn't mean you just have to go and get it open. You have to manage the disease. You have to manage the progression of the disease. And you have to also manage if there are any ulcers or wounds which are occurring. So it is important to go to a vascular specialist. And of course, the test that can be done, the most important test, believe it or not, is the examination of the patient. Most of us doctors, unfortunately, I'd say that for ourselves, most of us, we have forgotten the basic principles of examination. We do not touch the patient. I think it's extremely important that whenever a patient, a diabetic patient comes to us, we must examine the peripheral pulses. You know, we all check the pulse in the, in the, in the hand, in the arm, but the pulse to check here is the pulse in the foot. And if that pulse is present, then 90% of the vascular problems in the leg can be ruled out. But if we cannot feel the pulse in the leg, then you subject this patient to a further examination, which is either by a, a, a color Doppler examination. Can uh, Mr. Hardik show us the number two uh, slide, please? I have a slide with the uh, tests that we actually do to check up the uh, pulsations. No, the next one, slide number two. So, yeah, so this is the vascular assessment. The gadget that you see on the left-hand side is a handheld pocket Doppler, which can also be used to, to uh, hear fetal heart sounds. When a lady is pregnant, if you place that probe on the, on the, on the pregnant lady's stomach, uh, abdomen area, you can actually hear the heart beating of the baby. So that's the same little gadget, which can be used to check the, the, uh, the pulse at the back of the foot, just as, a, as you can see it at the ankle. Then we have a little... Uh, sort of sophisticated machines which we have at the Medanta Medicity Hospital in Gurgaon and in Delhi at the Defense Colony Clinic that we can actually measure the blood pressure of the uh, uh, of the of the um, in the in the foot and a color Doppler examination 
is the gold standard, which means a simple ultrasound examination, just the same machine with which we check the abdomen or for your gallbladder or for your um, uh, you know, kidney stones, the same machine by the same doctor can actually pick up the blockages in the blood vessels of the legs. So it's, that's called a color Doppler examination. And that is actually something which gives us a huge amount of information, tells us whether the artery is blocked or not, where exactly it's blocked, and what is the degree of blockage, and what exactly is uh, the extent of the blockage. After that, of course, we can have a CT scan, a CT scan angiography, or an MRI angiography. And of course, then the regular angiography, you must have heard of the angiography, which is done for the heart arteries. It's the same test, which is done through the same route in the, room, in the, in the groin, using the same uh, catheter. Instead of going up to the heart to study the heart arteries, we go down the legs to study the leg arteries. So an angiography of the legs is something which is completely diagnostic and tells us where exactly the blockages are. And of course, we can treat them accordingly. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, so uh, once we know uh, from all the tests that we you have just uh, uh, shown us, and once we know that there are blockages, uh, can these blockages be removed and can, uh, can these be removed with medicines? Uh, are you, is it possible? Um, well, blockages once formed de depends on the degree of blockages. If they are minor, if they are like 20, 30, 40 percent, they can be managed with medicines. They are usually not removed, but they can be kept static and uh, you know, uh, prevent the progression, which is, which is as good as, uh, as it can go. When, of course, you have to, if you've been a smoker, that has to completely stop because smoking is probably the one single um, uh, sort of, uh, you know, worst thing that you can do for yourself uh, if, if you have peripheral vascular disease along with diabetes. And, of course, you have to manage your diabetes, control your blood pressure, control your cholesterol. And most of these can be managed with medication just as that is done for the heart. So the normal blood thinners that are used for and prescribed by the cardiologist for managing your heart attack are the same medicines can be used for managing the leg attack or the peripheral arterial disease that we are talking about. So there are no extra drugs. It's just the same. But those medicines can be used to keep the arteries open. But occasionally very occasionally if the artery has suddenly gotten blocked with a clot then there are some clot busting medicines which can be either injected directly into the clot or into the patient's veins which can actually relieve symptoms but this is something which usually seldom done because the arteries usually are totally blocked and do not open up with blood thinning tablets or injections okay that's interesting. But uh, doctor, we would like to know that once we've started the treatment for somebody, uh, does this, uh, I mean, does this treatment has to go on for lifelong or uh, when do we stop it? Now, that's a very, very important and a very pertinent question. You see, unfortunately, I mean, as Dr. Bhadia also said, diabetes is a progressive disease. You've got to live with it. You can't fight it. You cannot wish it away. And you have to keep it under control. You have to basically learn how to live with your diabetes. And believe me, if you are comfortable and you manage it well and you are kept under supervision and you keep up with your appointments and keep up with your uh, investigations on a regular basis, you can actually lead your life very normally with the diabetes without any problems. But Medicines have to be continued. Please do not fall into this uh, assumption or get this assumption that once the artery is opened up, it's going to remain open despite medicine. You need to take medicines continuously, lifelong. They may not be very many, just maybe one or two uh, pills. Just as for the heart, you have to continue with them. You cannot stop them after some intervention or some procedure has been done. Wow. That's very, very important. So one has to take care and continue with it and not stop abruptly. You know, many a times, so many of our uh, clients and patients do that uh, once they feel comfortable. 
All right. So uh, now we come to a little further, like uh, uh, once we have done with the medication, but the things are not improving. Uh, do we have uh, some surgery? Can the blood vessel blockages be opened uh, with the keyhole surgery or you need to open up completely and have an open surgery? What are the kind of uh, processes or procedures you have, doctor? Right. Uh, so, as I said right at the beginning, a heart attack, if somebody gets a heart attack, you need to get an angiography done to identify where exactly the blockages are. And then the doctor advises either an angioplasty or a ballooning of the of the, of the uh, artery. And if the ballooning is not possible or multiple blockages are, 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 are present, then the doctor may advise a open heart surgery. Now, as the peripheral vascular disease is exactly the same as I said, it's a heart attack of the legs. We also, after doing an angiography, we know exactly where the blockages are. And six out of 10 times, maybe even seven out of 10 times today, we can actually manage these conditions without an operation, only using the same catheters and balloons just as those for the heart. So a ballooning and an angioplasty and a stent placement is possible and is what we do all the time uh, for, for opening up these arteries. Mr. Hardik, can you show me slides number three and then four, please? Thank you. So, uh, you know, I, I, will, I will show you exactly what this uh, ballooning means. You can see the slide on the left side, the one which shows the yellow plaque. That is the cholesterol and uh, all, the, all the calcium which is deposited, which is actually causing narrowing of the artery. This is, I mean, we can pass a balloon through that. During an angiography, we pass a balloon through that. And when we blow the balloon up, this artery opens up and this is what is called an angioplasty or a ballooning of the artery. Following this, we have to place a stent. Can you uh, show me the next slide, please? Number four. So following the ballooning, we can actually, as you can see here, this is the main artery of the body, which comes from the heart and divides into two and goes down into each leg. And you can see that this patient has a blockage at the junction at the division where the artery is dividing into two. And here we have inserted two balloons, one from each groin, just as one would do for the, for the heart. And we would go up into this area, balloon this up, and we have placed tents. And you can see that the arteries are completely opened up. Look at the difference between the left and the right side of the, of the screen, and you will see the blockage and how beautifully it has been opened up. Without an operation, the patient can actually get up and walk uh, home um, you know, go back home the next day without any problem and, of course, continue with his medical management. Uh, next, please. Slide number five. Now, here you can see that this patient has a blockage below the knee. And on the left-hand side, you see a patient with a wound. This wound will not heal unless this blood, this blood vessel is, re, uh, 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 I mean, you know, restored, which means that the flow has been restored. And here you can see in the slide number two and number three, we have done the angioplasty or the ballooning of this artery and connected up all the three blood vessels so that the increase in the blood supply into the foot can now result in healing of the ulcer. Look at the difference between the left side of the screen with the, with the ulcer in the foot and six weeks, or six or eight weeks later, the wound has completely healed up. So that's the difference that can be achieved by increasing the blood supply in these patients who have ulcers or wounds which do not heal up. Thank you. Really amazing difference. Absolutely uh, amazing. And uh, uh, we, diabetic foot infections, Dr. Parekh, are so very common. And you showed us how uh, you know it has been done so beautifully uh, with your help. You opened it up and it really cured within a few weeks. So uh, can these foot infections be uh, prevented? Can they be prevented? Uh, you know, let's not yeah. have them at all. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I think, I think you are absolutely right because once one has a diabetic foot infection, the chances of a recurrence, that means a re-infection uh, or a re-repeat um, um, you know, wound 
is very, very high. So the uh, crux of the matter is to try and prevent this wound from developing. And we must know exactly what to do so that every diabetic patient is aware that there is a problem which can be averted and it could be prevented. So the most important thing here is foot care, diabetic foot care, because if a patient with diabetes, unfortunately, as if you remember Dr. Bhatia saying that the nerves go, uh, I mean, you know, the nerves sort of get diseased in diabetes and the patient loses the power of sensation, loses the power of pain. You know, the most protective reflex God has given us is pain. We, if, if suppose somebody was to touch a very hot surface, you will immediately withdraw your finger. And this is what protects you from damaging your finger or your body because of the pain sensation. Now, if this pain sensation is, is, is disease, is, is, is sort of disappears or is not there, then that hot surface would actually cause a burn in your foot that a, a foot or wherever uh, it, it's touched. So this is exactly what happens because of the loss of the protective pain sensation, patients develop wounds which then progress to become very large and repetitively they become, the pressure is actually going to cause a wound. Can I, Mr. Hardik, can you show us slide number six? I have a very good slide which will actually show you exactly what is happening uh, in, a, in, in, a, in a patient, no, the next one, number six. Yeah, so here you can see because of the, because of the abnormal position of the toes of the foot in diabetic patients, because of the nerve involvement, these toes become deformed. You'll find a lot of people having very deformed feet. They start developing, um, uh, you know, deviated toes and stuff. And because of which the patients start bearing down too much a lot more on one part of the foot or on the toe. <coughs> Sorry. Because of continuously weight bearing on a particular area, that area forms a callus or a corn formation. You know, a lot of diabetic patients develop corns. And usually what people do have a corn and they go and get it cut. They get it removed. That's completely wrong. The pressure has caused the, the form the treatment is to remove the pressure, not remove the corn. You remove the pressure, the corn will not form again. Otherwise, you remove the corn because the pressure is always being exerted. Number two, if you keep walking on this corn, it will then form, I mean, it will then start to bleed and then get infected and that infection can actually spread into and affect the bone. And once that happens, that toe will have to be amputated. So repeatedly walking on an area which is painless, which is not uh, exhibiting any pain sensations, is what causes damage to the foot and leads to these pains, these uh, diabetic foot infections. And this is what actually leads to these infections, which uh, we have to avoid. So we should avoid walking bare feet, avoid wearing ill-fitting shoes you must have properly well-fitted shoes make sure that the shoes are not tight because you cannot remember the pain sensation is gone so if a shoe is tight or if it's ill-fitted you cannot see it so make sure that you are absolutely wearing clean shoes and they are well-fitted and you do not hurt yourself and you keep examining your feet on a regular basis to ensure that there is no damage or any ulcer which is forming in the foot so it's extremely important to prevent ulceration by avoiding pressure walking on a particular area. And that's the only way you can control and prevent. Uh... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, doctor. That was really interesting. And so the next obvious question is that if someone doesn't care about it and uh, diabetes is left untreated and so it must it might just go on to become the gangrene and uh, that's something very dreadful like you said earlier can diabetic patients uh, develop gangrene uh, of course due to uh, blood vessel blockages and do these wounds or gangrene heal after uh, the blockages have been removed is it possible 
Yes, uh, actually, uh, you know, just as I said, a person has a heart attack and the worst thing that can happen after a heart attack is that a part of the heart muscle dies. Now, similarly, if the blood vessel to the foot gets affected and gets completely blocked, a part of the toe or the foot or the entire leg can die and that is what is called gangrene and the treatment of gangrene is only an amputation of the area which is affected. But another word of caution, before any amputation is advised or undertaken, the most important thing that the doctor must ascertain is that what happens after the diabetic amputation has been done because to amputate, if there is inadequate blood supply at the level of the amputation, that wound will not heal. So it's extremely important to be sure that the blood supply to the affected part at the level of amputation is involved. only then will the amputation stump heal. So it's extremely important, don't go in for amputations without confirming that that wound which is going to be left behind after the amputation is going to heal. So it's ex extremely important to open up these arteries, get the blood flowing, and once the blood flows, Wounds do not heal by antibiotics or by injections or by wound dressings. Wounds heal by good blood supply and taking the pressure off. So, uh, uh, Mr. Hardik, can you show that slide number five again, please? The one which we uh, showed that there was an angioplasty with the, with the foot wound which is healed. I think it will be pertinent at this point. Uh, uh, you know, the, yeah. So, you can see uh, on the left side that has a wound which is being going on. Uh, he's actually even lost his big toe. You can see he has only three toes instead of five. So he's lost two toes already and there is an ulcer which is not healing. And that is primarily because you can see that red line which is the blocked artery, which is just depicting the blocked artery. Because of that blockage, there, is enough, there isn't enough blood for the wound to heal. And after the angioplasty, as you can see in slides number two and three, and we've opened up the arteries, and you can see the dramatic difference and the wound has actually healed up. So yes, wounds heal up completely if the ballooning and angioplasty and improvement of the blood supply is done. The patient controls the diabetes, controls blood pressure, stops smoking and prevents uh, excessive pressure. That means once the wound has healed up, you ensure that you do not exert on this area, wear a proper fitted shoe, maybe with an insole, so that the pressure in this area is avoided and the wound does not reopen or reform again. Thank you. Wonderful. I think you, uh, Dr. Parik, you answered the question uh, which was coming next, which was uh, how can we prevent amputation in diabetic patients? Right? Yeah, that's right. So, yes, amputation is preventable. You're absolutely right. Provided the patients are A, aware, all diabetics, even if they do not have any gangrene or any problem in their feet, must be aware that they must examine their feet every day. In fact, uh, I, I, I go one step further. Middle-aged, I mean elderly people, they should remove their looking mirrors from their bathroom, uh, you know, above the wash basins and place them at the foot level in front of, the, uh, in front of their WCs so that they can actually examine their feet every day themselves. Anything right. happens to their face, everybody will point out and say, look here what's happened to your face, but nobody will tell you what's happening to your feet. And it's that important that you must examine your feet every, every diabetic so that make sure that you do not and are not developing a wound because you have lost the protective pain sensation. And that is probably the most important, I think, message I would like to give here that avoid any trauma, make sure that you do not get an affected, uh, an infected foot infection. And if it does, get your blood supply checked immediately and ensure that the blood supply is opened up so that you do not land up with a disabling amputation. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think uh, we've had such a wonderful insights from you, doctor. And this is very interesting as, as to have a mirror down towards your legs rather than the face, because that's what is going to tell you if you have uh, any problem in your legs. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Parat. Dr. Bhatia, do we have any questions, more questions from uh, the viewers? Uh, 
Dr. Anju, you, uh, you have taken most of the questions up. So uh, Dr. Parikh has answered them. So we are, we are good to go. Uh, there's just one um, person not related to this, but she's asking her father has been advised. He's got 90% blockage in the neck artery, carotid artery. And uh, he's been advised to get a procedure done. So they're confused whether they should get an angioplasty done or they should open it up. So is there any way to decide? How do you decide whether you're going to do angioplasty and put in a stent or you're going to completely cut the artery and take out all the cheesy cholesterol material? So that's what she wanted to know. So Right. But I, I, I think, Deeraj, that's a very, very uh, important question. And I think, you know, there is a lot of uh, uh, science now behind this. If you can actually remove the blockage, that is a much better way of taking, I mean, taking care of that artery. Because if you place a stent, all you're doing is that you're plastering the blockage to the sides and that blockage can actually still keep showering up into the brain and the patient, the person can continue to have, um, uh, you know, TIAs or, or minor strokes. But if you can actually open up this artery and mind you, we do this under local anesthesia. We do not give general anesthesia. We open up this artery under local anesthesia, remove the blockage and close the same artery itself. And the blockage and this cheesy clotting, uh, you know, the, the cholesterol material is removed completely away from the system. And once the surgery is done, the patient can actually be completely uh, symptom free and, and without any complications for all time to come. Wonderful. Very nice. Well, Wonderful. I think other team will be very happy because she was very confused about this. So right. thanks, thanks, because very clearly put, and I think that's excellent. Uh, one uh, la lady, I think Vanilla, she's asked for uh, how to prevent pre-diabetes going to diabetes. One of the only thing which I would say is, uh, answer is that be very careful about weight gain. In fact, lose weight. Look at your BMI. Uh, the guidelines for Asian Indians is 23. So make sure that your BMI comes down to 23 and look at your waist circumference. In females, mm -hmm. the cutoff is 80. Right, so it's 80 centimeters and males is 90, which they brought down down to 85, but which is hard. But for females, it's 80 centimeters. So 80 there and a BMI of 23, you're good. And then she said, uh, "How do I manage? You know, with whatever." So obviously, it's a lot of cardio and diet. So diet, she said, "What diet?" And I think Dr. Dipti is taking over the next. So she will give a brief on di pre-diabetic diabetes. Uh, so the diet really for pre-diabetes and diabetes and PCOS. And obstructive sleep apnea is all the same, the same guidelines, the same guidelines. So actually, uh, uh, the not killing two birds with one stone, she's probably be killing five birds with one stone. So <laughs> the over right. thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bhatia. And uh, again, uh, we, have, we have to really thank Dr. Parikh for such wonderful session and so useful insights about diabetes and related vascular complication and why it is so important to know since they are reversible if they are detected in time. Thank you so much, Dr. Parekh. It was such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you, Dr. Gay. Thank you, Dr. Bhatia. I think it's a great platform and wish you well. And I'm sure you will continue to educate the public and... <clears throat> and continue with this uh, wonderful activity. I didn't know, unfortunately, uh, much about this, but I am really, really honored to be on this platform. Thank you. Thank beautiful, you so uh, much. Beautiful yeah. slides and very nice uh, angioplasty. Especially the angioplasty is very impressive, the, the ballooning and, and the stents which you put in, especially the way you open up those two arteries, which is complicated. Yes. Really, very impressive. Absolutely We're going to a miracle. I think we'll for one more session subsequently in the following year or whenever we can for, yes. for varicose veins uh, and deep yes. vein thrombosis because that, as you were discussing, is a totally different chapter from the arterial. And since we in VLCC uh, see so much of uh, obesity-related varicose veins and uh, deep vein thrombosis, I think that will be very good for our viewers. Uh, we would yes. definitely like to take your uh, inputs on that. And I think, Dipti, over to you because we are short, running short. So please take your time and... My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so That's much, nice. Dr. Parekh. Nice. Thank you once again. Very nice. Okay, Thank like you. Then Dr. Bhatia said, it's now let's now explore uh, how diet can help. And to help us, I am really pleased to introduce uh, our next panelist, Dr. Deepti Verma, who was who with over 25 years in the field of nutrition and dietetics, currently heads nutrition at VLCC's skill development. 
and she has been an educationist, writer, and editor, and has been felicitated with several awards for her contribution to nutrition, including the Lifetime Achievement Award in September 2019. Welcome, Dr. Deepti, and it's wonderful to have you as always with us today. And uh, let's quickly start with the question now, right? So yes. obvious question is, uh, yes, uh, welcome once again. Yeah. So let me start with the question. The obvious question is, are there any specific foods you would recommend for a diabetic patient? Yes, absolutely. As Dr. Bhatia has just mentioned, it is lose weight, lose weight, lose weight, because that is the key to actually reversing hyperglycemia and insulin insensitivity. Sensitivity. So we've spoken so much about diabetes and vascular diseases, but very important, of course, to lose weight. We all know that, you know, consult a dietitian or contact the nearest VLCC center. We'll help you lose weight in case you're finding it very hard to. And uh, diet wise, of course, it's very, very important to cut down on the calories. Um, and of course, physical activity, which uh, is championed by uh, Dr. Gai. She'll be talking about it. So as they say, sitting is the new smoking. And uh, people are actually very, very sedentary these days. And uh, of course, very important is to follow the circadian rhythm. Sleep cycle uh, plays a huge role when it comes to reversing of obesity. Uh, because, you know, uh, when, when people who sleep late, which is so much trending in today's times, they release a hormone called ghrelin, which does not allow one to lose weight. So this is one thing. And of course, stress management. Uh, Dr. Gai will be talking about it. So these are the points. And other than this, of course, to manage diabetes, very important, you know, like I'd more like to talk about what not to do because any food that nature has in store is something that is going to help us uh, gain the perfect health. But the things which is not made by the nature, which is processed foods, sodas, white sugar, and the other foods, edited drinks are something which is a total no, especially when it comes to white bread, cookies, biscuits, rusk, pasta and anything which is made with refined flour that people are actually binging on. So that's like one pertinent advice I'd like to give to anybody who's trying to lose weight and who's managing um, diabetes. So uh, yeah, this is, yeah. this is, and yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm sure uh, people are listening to it. And of course, uh, Dr. Deepthi, we do have some special functional foods too, you know, that help the diabetes. Uh, diabetics, you know, there's something absolutely. And since I always say to all the patients and students that diabetes and CVD are twin sisters or twin brothers, so they always come together. So, the first functional food that we normally advise and which has been shown to give remarkable results is oats. Uh, so, people can take in the oatmeal or people can take in something like a vegetable poha, they can make vegetable oats. Uh, which is really good because it contains multiple phenols, uh, alkaloids and beta-glucan as a soluble fiber, which has amazing results when it comes to having, uh, uh, you know, reversal of insulin insensitivity and kind of manages and controls diabetes gradually. And now we would like to leave you with a very positive message that diabetes, though may not be so bad, is preventable if taken early, uh, you know, precautions when it is in the pre-diabetic stage and it is controllable if you do have it. Seek expert help early to understand what's best for you. Take it seriously. Losing weight is always a good first step and keep it in, uh, keeping it, uh, you know, off is the next big one. And uh, so stress versus the problem. Don't let it creep into your life as best as you can, fill your life with friendship, family, pets, laughter and love, and real relationships are the best support for lifelong healthy life. And finally, keep smiling, feel good about yourself, and you are always special. So thank you all for attending our webinar and guiding our discussions with your wonderful questions. And special thanks again to our expert panelists, Dr. Rajiv Parekh, Dr. Patia, Dr. Deepti, for all the wonderful learnings today. And if you wish to know more, there is a VLCC center near you and uh, where our team of experts is just waiting 
to meet you and guide you. Wish you all a healthy life filled with happiness and fulfillment and have a very good evening and goodbye. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you once again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend. Thank, thank you. you.